Okay, so as I go into, I'm going to tell a story today, and it will have. Oh, I think your spot's up here, Bert. <laughs> and that introduction was perfect, perfect setup for what I'm going to talk about today. Um, my story is not going to be directly applicable to predicting individualized responses, but I think a lot of the methodologies that I'll cover are the first step in that direction, which is why I think I'm going to be talking today. Um, okay, so I'll just get started. So small molecule drugs are the cornerstone and have been the cornerstone of modern medical practice. They treat millions of patients, improving their lives and their outcomes, and they make drug companies billions of dollars. But <clears throat> as we all know, these drugs are plagued by the onset of unexpected side effects. These side effects cost not only lives but money. And, um, and most recently, in fact, I'd like to point out uh, in February, almost a little over a year ago, February 2012, the FDA issued alerts about cholesterol drugs known as statins. As most of you know, these are considered one of the most safest drugs that we have. Um, in fact, there was talk about putting them in our water. But even these drugs, which we consider very safe and effective, can cause very dangerous and unexpected side effects. And then there was this call a few years ago in the New York Times, which I always find laughable, to urging a public database to be created to monitor drug safety. Well, of course, the FDA has been doing this for 30 years, and it's called the Adverse Event Reporting System. And here is just a snapshot of the amount of reports that are taken that are either serious or cause death um, into the FDA's adverse event reporting system over the last decade. So what does it look like right now? Well, it has over 3 million. It's an observational clinical data set, one of my favorite types of data sets. It has over 3 million reports collected. They collect sparse data on age, sex, weight, the country of origin. They collect sparse data on the drugs that a patient might be taking. They collect sparse data on the diseases that they were being treated for. And they collect slightly less sparse data on the adverse events that occurred to that patient. And this is a great opportunity to study adverse drug events in a large clinical population. But just interpreting one of these adverse event reports is very difficult. So here you have a patient who is on metformin, was glitazone, pravastatin, Sacro, maybe they had a transplant, and they had these adverse events. So how do you know which drug is causing which adverse event? If you just try and draw all the lines, you'll end up with an enormous amount of false positive associations. And this is the challenge that the FDA faces every day. So, and spontaneous reporting systems, like the adverse event reporting systems and other like it, and observational data in general, are biased. And these biases introduce what I've been calling synthetic associations, simply confounded associations. There are biases or synthetic associations introduced by co-prescription effects. So for example, it's very common to see aspirin co-prescribed with Vioxx. And so what you'd see if you did a naive analysis of the FDA's adverse event reporting system or essentially any clinical observational data set, you would find that aspirin has a very significant increase, uh, increases your risk of heart attack. And if you dig down a little bit deeper, you can see that a lot of these are actually because there's an enormous signal for Vioxx, especially in the adverse event reporting system, um, that causes that false association with these other co-prescribed drugs. In addition, you have synthetic associations introduced by indications. So lots of times what you see are that drugs that are given to diabetics, hypoglycemic drugs, are often associated very commonly with hyperglycemia as their adverse event. This, of course, is a nonsensical result and it's really just that the patient's diabetes is not being controlled. And that is coming through. The physician records everything he sees, and hyperglycemia gets reported and linked to diabetes drugs as a potential adverse event. So propensity score matching is a technique used in observational data analysis to correct for exactly these types of effects. You can identify a matched set of controls for your studied exposed cases. And you do it by modeling the likelihood that a patient is going to be exposed to a drug. So take everything you know about all of your patients in your data set and try to predict whether or not they will receive the drug. And you can use a logistic regression model to do this. And then that gives you a probability for every patient on whether or not they will be exposed. And you can simply match patients who weren't exposed to those that were based on these probabilities. 
It's a very effective method and actually produces effect estimates that are very close to what you'd see in randomized clinical trials uh, in idealized settings, but still. But what does this require? You have to not only know all of your confounding covariates, but you also have to have them measured. And that's something that we typically do not have in these spontaneously collected large observational data sets, which I group the adverse event reporting system and also the electronic health records into. You don't necessarily capture all of the variables you would like to or that you might need. So what I did is I developed a new propensity score matching method, or I adapted it slightly. Um, and in this, we assume that we can represent the entire space of confounding covariates by two simple and easily collected variables, which are the drugs that a patient is prescribed and the indications that they're being treated for. So it turns out you can tell a lot about a patient if you just have their list of drugs that they're taking. Now, if they're on birth control, you know right away that they're female. If they're on a cholesterol-lowering drug, you know they've been exposed to a high-fat diet, so you're getting environmental exposures. Um, you know if they're on an antidepressant, then um, they're more likely to be female than male. And these have varying degrees of success, but our idea is that let's take these all in together, and then we can kind of paint a picture about this patient. We can use this information to stand in for the actual important covariates. I'm just going to go through a uh, picture which exemplifies this approach, and then I'll go through a specific example. So here in the center of this bullseye, we have in gold, we have the reports that for this query drug, the drug of interest that we're studying. Here is all other reports, and so this could be all other patients in your electronic health records, or it could be all other adverse drug event reports in the adverse event reporting system. So the first thing we do is we reduce, and we only consider those reports which have significantly co-prescribed prescriptions listed, and then further we reduce to only those reports that have significantly correlated indications listed. So essentially, what are we doing? We're reducing the number of reports we can use as our controls. And this set of reports is less biased relative to our set of cases. <coughs> and so what this does is it takes advantage of this enormous data set and the natural covariances that exist in that data. <coughs> so now I'll go through a specific example. Before I mentioned that it is very common to see hyperglycemia associated with diabetes drugs this nonsensical result. And if you look at it, you can see that 17.7% .7 of reports for diabetes drugs list hyperglycemia as an adverse event. If you just take the entire data set as your control, what you'd see is approximately 1.5% of reports list hyperglycemia of all for all drugs. And so 17.7 divided by 1.5 is something much greater than 2, which is the standard significance cutoff. And so that's why you're seeing these false associations. But if you use this approach and you restrict your cohort to this subset, we then estimate that the expected frequency of reporting hyperglycemia for other drugs is actually for uh, drugs that are related to these drugs, but not these diabetes drugs, is 17.6%. That's what we would have estimated. 17.7, 17.6, that's essentially one, and this is no longer significant. Um, and so now I'll show you that, yes, it's true not only for diabetes, drugs, and hyperglycemia, but that we can correct for biases across the entire data set. Here we have the reporting correlation between a drug and an indication. So in the case of diabetes and uh, diabetes drugs, that correlation is very high. It is very common to see as an indication diabetes when the patient is taking diabetes drugs. And so that's why I put the purple uh, up there in the right-hand corner. And as you can see, as the drug becomes more tightly correlated with its indication, and the hypothesis there is that it's, that is the indication for the drug, or it's commonly co-prescribed with drugs that are, have that indication, you can see that the probability that you're going to synthetically or falsely associate this drug with the indication's effects increases. And so this is simply a representation of that bias in the data set. And so here I'll show some more examples. Here are those drugs given to diabetics. Um, in the tr diamonds, we have their original association scores, which are above this arbitrary, well, not entirely arbitrary, thresh significance threshold cutoff. And then after you apply our method, you can see that all of that signal is dampened and those false positives are removed. This works for others. So here's antiarrhythmia and uh, antiarrhythmics and arrhythmia. You can see that many false positives exist before we apply the method. And then after we apply the method, many of these are removed. <coughs> 
It's important to note that some of these that are not, that are still significant even after we apply this approach, um, are actually known to have prorhythmic effects. And in fact, all three that are still above the significance threshold do have prorhythmic effects that limit their use. Dovetalide is the best example. Okay, so here I showed you that here is a representation again. This line is a representation of the bias. And uh, here's what happens when we apply this method and correct for that bias. You can see there's no longer a significant relationship between how tightly correlated a drug is to its indication and the reporting of these or the significance of these false adverse events. Uh, it not only works for things that we included in the model, we included indications, so we'd expect it to work in that scenario, but it also works for implicitly correcting for other biases, such as age. So here, for example, we have the average association score between a drug and myocardial infarction versus that drug's average age. And so you can see that as patients, the patient cohorts who take a particular drug get younger, they're less likely to be associated with MI. And that's not because, that has nothing to do with the drug. It's, uh, it's simply that patients who are younger are less likely to have frequent MIs. And when you compare that to the entire data set, in which the average age is around 60, you'll see that it's, uh, it's, even if the drug is inducing heart attacks, it's very hard to observe that. And so what you'd like to see is that it's a nice random distribution around one, and after you apply our method, we remove that relationship and that bias is corrected. Um, here is exactly the same plot, except we have the top 20 most biased drugs in terms of the ages for which they're, uh, the average age of the patient that's prescribed those drugs. So here, for example, we have Xanamivir. The average age of the patient who's prescribed Xanamivir is approximately 35 years younger than the average age of a patient in the entire database, whether that's your adverse event reporting system or your observation clinical data set. And then after we apply our method, you can see that these differences, the selected cohort matches much more closely in this implicit variable. The model was never exposed to these data, and yet it is able to correct for this effect. Um, and here's a fun one I like to show. Here's the average association score between a drug and so-called manly adverse events. These are adverse events that only occur to males, um, things like uh, your testicle didn't drop, which would occur to very young males, um, or testicular cancer, um, lots of sexual things. And so you can see, as the proportion of males, as the number of males increases, uh, the proportion who are prescribed that drug is male increases. You can see the association also increases. And the method corrects for that. OK. So I showed you that what we can do is we can correct for the implicit, uncharacterized biases in large observational clinical data sets, at least in the sense uh, to support data mining. But there's this other problem, which is of under and non-reporting of adverse events, or we call this often missing data, where the only patients that you observe in your EHRs are ones that are sick. And so you have uh, no observations for the ones that are healthy. And oftentimes, we actually cannot track a patient. They come into our hospital for a day, and then they leave, and we never see them again. So if there are no reports or no observations, then the current method simply cannot find any association. <clears throat> So I'm just going to show you how we, uh, we attack this approach. So here we use the same effect, we use the same model that a physician uses to diagnose disease. Here we have diabetes, some unmeasured effect. And what happens is the patient walks in, um, some observations are made by the physician, and they say, hmm, I think you might have diabetes. They might run a glucose, and they confirm their hypothesis. So you can't see diabetes, but you can measure blood glucose. We use the exact same model for adverse drug events. Here you have some unmeasured unreported adverse event, and it, we hypothesize that it's associated with these other less severe adverse events that will be reported more commonly, and so more likely to be observed. We construct a model, and then we can identify adverse drug events. We use this model to identify a drug-drug interaction between paroxetine and pravastatin, and we use the electronic health records to validate that. So here are our top predictions for our our drug-drug interaction model using this latent detection approach, and proxetine pravastatin is on top. We estimate approximately a million patients each year take this combination of drugs. We analyze the blood glucose values of approximately uh, 3,800 patients. 2,000 patients are on pravastatin. We saw no change in their blood glucose. 1,600 patients on paroxetine. We saw no change in their blood glucose. But patients who took the combination, proxetine and pravastatin, 
So almost a 20 milligram per deciliter increase in their blood glucose. <coughs> That's when we exclude diabetics. When we include diabetics, that increases to approximately 60 milligrams per deciliter. Um, but, so, the, so we can validate or at least corroborate our data mining hypotheses by using observational clinical data from the electronic health records. Um, this is an observational study itself, and so there's lots of limitations in terms of uh, concomitant medications, other covariates. None of those were significant. So informatics has taken us very far, but ultimately what we need to do, and I would propose we need to do this more often, is to actually go into some model systems. So we have this experiment. We have 10 control mice, uh, 10 mice on a high-fat diet that simulates pre-diabetes. What does that mean? It feeds mostly butter in their food, and instead of water, I gave them Sprite. Within 30 days, these mice get insulin resistant. Then we have these mice on a high-fat diet, give them pravastatin, we give some of them proxetine, and some of them the combination of both. And what we see is exactly almost the same thing we saw in the diabetics, approximately 60 milligram per deciliter increase in their blood glucose for the, for the mice that are on the combination of these two drugs compared to normal. And so I've shown you how we can use statistical approaches to correct for hidden covariates, the bias introduced by hidden covariates. We can infer the presence of latent effects even when they're not observed in your observational data. And we can corroborate these effects using other observational data sets or, and validate them in model systems. Thank you. So we'll hold uh, questions for uh, after the opportunity to hear as well from uh, Michael Catan, who's chairman of the Department of Quantitative Health Sciences at the Cleveland Clinic, where, uh, and also professor of medicine, epidemiology, and biostatistics at uh, the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine. Uh, Michael? <laughs> 